Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of our webinar series, Irrigation of Controlled Environment Crops for Increased Quality and Yield. Today's presentation will be about 30 minutes, followed by about 10 minutes of Q&A with our presenter, Dr. Galen Campbell, whom I'll introduce in just a moment. But before we start, we've got a couple of housekeeping items. First, we wanted this webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit any and all questions in the questions pane, and we'll be keeping track of these for the Q&A session toward the end. Second, if you want us to go back or repeat something you missed, don't worry, we'll be sending around a recording of the webinar via email within the next three to five business days. All right, with all of that out of the way, let's get started. Today, we'll hear from Dr. Galen Campbell, who will discuss how to measure EC and osmotic stress to optimize crop steering for maximum yield. Dr. Campbell has been a research scientist and engineer at METER for over 20 years, following nearly 30 years on faculty at Washington State University. His first experience with environmental measurement came in the lab of Sterling Taylor at Utah State University, making water potential measurements to understand plant water status. Dr. Campbell is one of the world's foremost authorities on physical measurements in the soil plant, excuse me, soil plant atmosphere continuum. His book written with Dr. John Norman on environmental biophysics provides a critical foundation for anyone interested in understanding the physics of the natural world. He has written three books, over 100 refereed journal articles and book chapters, and has several patents. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Galen to get us started. Okay, thank you. And thanks for being with us today for this uh, second installment. The picture on the right, um, <clears throat> I borrowed from Dr. Bruce Bugby at Utah State University, shows the nine environmental variables or parameters that represent the main connections between the plant and its environment. It's useful to think of some of these environmental parameters, such as light, carbon dioxide, water, and nutrients as resources, and to consider the factors that enable the plant to capture those resources. Assimilation is the process by which carbon dioxide, water, and light from the plant environment are captured and converted to carbohydrate. To grow, the plant captures nutrients and water and combines those with the carbohydrate uh, produced by assimilation to make stems, leaves, roots, flowers, and uh, all that makes up the biomass of the plant. Now, the third process that I've listed here um, occurs simultaneously with the other two, but doesn't directly capture resources. Development is the progression of the plant through recognizable phases. The rate of development can be influenced by the availability of resources, but it's most strongly influenced by temperature and day length. On the other hand, development can strongly influence the plant's resource capture since it controls the time in each of these phases. Now, in controlled environment crop production, all of these variables that I've listed here are under the control of the grower. It's the job of the grower to choose the values of each of these variables to attain the goals of the production facility. To properly control these variables, the grower needs to know what they are and how they influence the outcome of the production process. The Arroyo production platform is capable uh, of monitoring these variables and reporting their values to the grower. Now, in our last session, we talked about substrates and how to monitor the water in them. This time, we want to fo focus more specifically on nutrients and stress. As we said last time in controlled environment production, the nutrients are supplied with the water. Uh, the nutrient solution is carefully designed as a mixture of the macro and micronutrients uh, that are needed for plant growth. To determine the actual concentration of any given nutrient element would be a big job, but fortunately we don't need to do that uh, to know that the nutrient needs of the plant are being met. Uh, the graph here shows the relationship between nutrient concentration in grams per liter on the x-axis and electrical conductivity 
of the solution on the y-axis uh, for two different uh, nutrient mixes, one that's optimized for vegetative production and the other optimized for flower. The relationship is nearly linear, so if we know the electrical conductivity of the solution and we know uh, what uh, nutrients went into it, we can know the concentration of the nutrients. If the nutrient solution is properly designed, uh, the plant will take up the nutrients in proportion, in the proportion that they exist in the solution. So the ratios should remain approximately constant. Now the slope of the line does depend a little bit on the mix that we use, but uh, you can see that something around three decisiemens per meter uh, in, is equivalent to a concentration about three grams per liter. So uh, roughly a one-to-one -one relationship between those two. And that relationship means that we can use electrical conductivity as a surrogate for the nutrient concentration. Now in our previous webinar we talked about the Teros 12 probe that measures water content, electrical conductivity, and temperature. So three of the four below ground environmental variables that we talked about in the first slide. Now even the fourth of those variables, oxygen, relates closely to the water content and temperature that are measured with the Teros 12. And so that one probe gives us essentially all of the environmental variables uh, for the below ground uh, plant portion. We said that dielectric from which we get water content is measured between the first and second time of the probe. The electrical conductivity is measured between the second and third time. Uh, temperature is measured in the center time. But the electrical conductivity that we measure is the bulk electrical conductivity. The electrical conductivity that we want to know um, is the conductivity of the water in the substrate pores. Um, that's the pore water electrical conductivity. We use the symbol EC sub W. That's what the plant sees, and that's the one that we graphed in the previous slide. Um, we might ask, uh, why aren't they the same? Now, electrical conductivity is a measure of how well a conductor conducts electricity. Salty water is a conductor. In the left diagram, uh, we have just uh, salt or water with salt in it. Uh, nothing there impedes the flow of electricity, and so the bulk conductivity is the same as the uh, pore water conductivity, or ECW. But if we add soil or substrate particles to the water, uh, like we have in the middle picture, the cross-section for flow of electricity is decreased by the, the uh, solids in the water, and the length of the flow path is increased, so the conductivity is decreased. Now, in a, in a typical saturated soil, uh, the, those effects make it so that the uh, bulk electrical conductivity is about one-third of the poor water electrical conductivity. Uh, in saturated horticultural substrates, uh, there's a lot less solids present, and so that, that ratio is larger. If uh, the soil, if we desaturate the soil or the substrate so that there are air pockets, then the cross-section for flow of electricity is further reduced and the distance for the electricity to travel further increased. So that ratio um, of the bulk EC to the uh, pore water EC is further increased. We show a value of 10 here, uh, but in drier soils, of course, it's even much higher than that. 
Now the pore water electrical conductivity is always greater than or equal to the bulk electrical conductivity as we just discussed. This graph shows a typical multiplier to get from bulk uh, electrical conductivity to poor water electrical conductivity. And of course, this relationship will depend on the particular medium that you're working in, but for any given medium it can be found. You can see that for uh, dry substrate or dry soil, that uh, multiplier gets pretty big and you might also infer also pretty uh, unreliable. Uh, if you get below water content, say, of about 0.3 or 30 percent, uh, you're multiplying by numbers like 15 or 20. Uh, and so probably you, you wouldn't uh, count on those numbers uh, very much. They could be fairly unreliable. You'd use this relationship and the water content that you measure uh, with the uh, dielectric to uh, do the conversion uh, from, uh, pour, or from bulk EC to pour water EC. Once you've done that conversion, then you would, um, you would or found that multiplier, you'd multiply that by the uh, bulk EC to get the pore water EC and finally you'd apply the temperature correction to it to correct to a standard temperature to get the nutrient concentration. Now this all looks simple enough but getting this relationship is not a trivial matter. So one of our strengths at METER, uh, we have soil physicists on staff who know the theory and can make the measurements to obtain uh, reliable relationships like this for whatever substrate you might be using. Now both the water and the salt in the soil is dynamic. To make sense of the changes that we see, uh, we need to have some feeling for, those process, for the processes that change the concentrations of water and salt or nutrients in the substrate. Infiltration occurs when water and nutrients enter the substrate. Redistribution occurs as matrix and gravitational forces move the water and nutrients deeper into the substrate following infiltration. And in both of those cases, the infiltration and redistribution, the salts move with the water. Evaporation occurs when uh, liquid water turns to vapor at the substrate surface. Transpiration uh, is the uptake of water by the plant, uh, transport to the evaporating surfaces of the leaf and its evaporation to the atmosphere. In both of those cases, the water leaves, but the salts uh, stay behind, leaving the remaining water more concentrated. The final, pro final process that I list here is the uptake of nutrients. Um, the plant removes the nutrients from the substrate solution. Um, the nutrients, of course, move to the root surface with the water and are taken up, but uh, nutrient uptake isn't a passive process. There are membranes at the endodermis in the root and the plant determines which ions are taken up and which are left in solution. Now let's look at some examples of these processes uh, to further illustrate what I'm talking about here. This is a single day's record uh, from Arroyo. Uh, the water content uh, for Materas 12 is the blue line shown on the right axis. The poor water electrical conductivity that we calculated uh, the way we explained previously is the red line and it's shown on the le left axis. The yellow spikes are irrigation shots. Um, there, there are 10 of them. They're spaced about 15 minutes apart and uh, there were 240 milliliters in each shot. All three processes that we just mentioned can be seen in this graph, but 
For our purposes right now, we want to focus on the time just as irrigation starts. So look where the, the yellow lines are and where the irrigation starts. Irrigation and redistribution are occurring uh, during this time. Uh, I'm sorry, infiltration and redistribution are occurring. And as the water rapidly, water content rapidly increases uh, at the beginning of irrigation, the electrical conductivity and therefore the nutrient concentration in the substrate also rapidly increase. Uh, the nutrients move with the water to replenish the substrate. Now the colors and the axes are the same here as in the previous slide. And here we see two days. We don't see the irrigations, the yellow lines, they're gone, but you can uh, tell when irrigation is occurring by the water content record when the water content rapidly increases. The part I want you to notice is the increase in pore water electrical conductivity as the water content is depleted by transpiration. Uh, so the, the electrical conductivity starts at about 9 decisiemens per meter and by the uh, time it gets to the next irrigation it's up to almost 20. The water content during that time changed from about 50% down to 30%. Now if we took half the water out of a substrate and left all of the salt there, the salt concentration uh, would double. And that's what's going on here. The dry down after irrigation we call dry back. And that's the tool that we use to apply controlled stress in uh, controlled environment crops. Now the colors and the axes here again are similar to the previous ones. We're looking at a 24-hour period of time. Uh, as before, we've but we've shifted the axis, uh, shifted the irrigation time so that uh, it starts at the uh, toward the left-hand side, and you can see a whole day of dry down. Uh, the water content de uh, decreases rapidly until about the middle of the graph. You can see that, and that, that's when the lights are on. And then it decreases more slowly uh, for the rest of the uh, day as the lights are off. Um, the electrical conductivity increases rapidly as irrigation is applied and, and uh, fresh nutrients come in. Um, it stays fairly constant while the lights um, are on. And then at night it drops uh, more rapidly, presumably from nutrient uptake than the, by the plant. Since both water content and nutrient uh, and the electrical conductivity, or water electrical conductivity, are changing. Um, how can we know what's happening to the nutrients in the substrate? Well, it turns out that uh, the measure can be computed from these numbers that we already have that will tell us what the, the amount of nutrients is still in the, in the substrate. If we start with the, uh, go through this dimensional analysis, uh, we start with kilograms of salt per cubic meter of water in the soil. That's proportional to the poor water electrical conductivity. And we multiply that by the water content in cubic meters of water per cubic meter of soil. That comes out to be kilograms of salt per cubic meter of soil. Or in other words, the, the salt content or nutrient content of the soil. So multiplying water content by pore water EC gives us the amount of nutrients per unit volume of soil. Now I've plotted that quantity here as the gray line. You can uh, easily see now by looking at it that um, 
nutrients are added um, to the substrate when we irrigate and they're taken up at a more or less constant rate for the rest of the day. Now this is a pretty powerful tool that can give us some good insights about nutrient uptake. Well, let's turn our attention now to crop steering. Um, Arroyo publishes a crop steering guide on the internet, and if you look in that, you'll see the following statement. Crop steering is a plant growth management practice that manipulates the environment, light, climate, irrigation, to encourage plants to grow a certain way. Next to light intensity, it's the most important tactic you can use to manipulate yield. And then they have a couple of um, recommendations. Irrigation for optimum vegetative growth, no water stress, and irrigation for optimum generative growth, simulated water stress. Um, but how do we simulate water stress in a controlled environment? Let's review a couple of points from the last lecture to remind you about uh, measuring water availability to plants. Water potential is a measure of the work required to remove water from a substrate. The two most important components of the water potential with respect to plant water availability are the matrix and the osmotic potential. The water potential is the sum of the two. Matrix forces come from the attraction of the matrix or substrate for the water. Osmotic forces come from the dilution of the water by salts when a semipermeable membrane is present. Now in the last lecture we showed that least over the water content range normally used in horticultural media the matrix potential change um, is too small to be of significance to the plant. So the important point I want to make here is if we want to simulate water stress, it has to be by manipulating the osmotic potential. Now we showed earlier that electrical conductivity and salt concentration are linearly related. Here we show that osmotic potential and electrical conductivity are also linearly related. Now there is a little scatter in this data. Measurements of water potential in this close to zero are kind of difficult to do. But again, meter builds and sells the equipment that make these measurements. Um, the number for you to remember is minus 40 kilopascals per decisiemen per meter. And that'll be a useful number whenever you want to convert back and forth between electrical conductivity and osmotic potential. So a 2.5 decisiemen per meter solution uh, would have an osmotic potential around minus 100 kilopascals. This is the same graph we saw earlier to illustrate electrical conductivity changes in the substrate as the plant takes up water. But now the left vertical axis shows osmotic potential rather than electrical conductivity. Osmotic potentials are negative numbers, but it's easier to see what's going on if we show them uh, as positive. So I've just shown the magnitude here. The osmotic potential recovers to around minus 400 kilopascals after irrigation, and then it decreases to around minus 800 kilopascals just before irrigation. Now, what does this mean? There's a lot of literature on the effect of matrix stress on plants growing in soil. There's also a lot of literature on effects of soil salinity on plant on crop production. But I'm not aware of much literature showing effects of nutrient solution-induced water stress on growth and assimilation. 
uh, soil nitric potential of minus 100 kilopascals would start to reduce growth in many species, and a soil matrix potential of minus 1,000 kilopascals would stop the growth and would reduce assimilation. The nominal permanent wilting point uh, for soil is minus uh, 1,500 kilopascals, and so this might give some rough ideas of, of um, what this range of, of osmotic potentials would do. And I think you can see that the stress during the dryback uh, that we're applying here would be significant. Now species and even cultivars differ substantially in their response to stress. So I don't think any general guideline is possible. The grower has to determine the appropriate levels by experimentation. It's important though uh, that however uh, or it's important though that it's the decrease in osmotic potential or the increase in poor water EC that's important not the change in water content of the substrate. The dryback is important for concentrating the nutrient solution but if the solution ECs are so low that the plant takes up the nutrients and there's little or no increase in poor water EC, then no crop steering will occur, uh, even with a large dryback. We talked last time about the equipment needed to get the data for managing nutrients in water. The Roya nose provides the communication. The Terrace 12 makes the measurements of water content, EC, and temperature. The Uroya software processes, stores, and displays the data so that you can know what's going on to make decisions. I showed this graph too in the previous webinar, but hopefully it'll make more sense now with your additional knowledge. It's for the whole nine weeks of a grove. Light below the canopy is shown in green, so you can see the day-night cycle and uh, that the canopy starts out sparse, letting a lot of light through, and then it quickly closes and the light below the canopy goes to a low value and stays there. Temperature is in purple, uh, water content's blue, poor water EC is in red. Um, now in week two, the water content is reduced to eliminate drainage and concentrate the nutrients. Here the electrical conductivity starts to increase. Through week three, the water content is manipulated to get quite high electrical conductivity values, some of them higher than 20 decisiemens per meter. The end of week three, the water content is increased sufficiently to initiate drainage and bring the electrical conductivity down to about seven decisiemens per meter where they maintain it for a couple of weeks. During week five and six, the drainage is increased even more to bring the electrical conductivity down to around five. Finally, at the end of the uh, grow, the dryback and the electrical conductivity are increased again by dropping the average water content. Now, the point in showing this is not to say that this is how every crop should be grown. Uh, the recipe is for this is probably different for each species and each cultivar that you would grow. The point is to illustrate how you can uh, do crop steering if you monitor and know what's going on in the root zone of your crop. This steering would be impossible without good sensors, good calibrations, and a good understanding of what you're measuring and how to, man how to manipulate it. So to conclude, uh, I think we can make these points that electrical conductivity directly measures the concentration of nutrients in the irrigation water. But uh, sensors measure the bulk electrical conductivity and what we need to know is, is the solution electrical conductivity so we have to have a way of converting between the two. Uh, the water and nutrients vary over time, 
for a number of different reasons. And we need to monitor both of those to know what's going on in the root zone of the crop. Um, we showed that osmotic potential and electrical conductivity are uh, directly related to each other and that you can use electrical conductivity as a surrogate for osmotic potential. And that we can manipulate the osmotic potential to uh, simulate stress uh, for crop steering. Finally, that careful monitoring and control of water and nutrients is essential for optimum production. So thanks for being with us today. We hope these ideas will be useful to you in managing the irrigation of your controlled environment crops. All right, thank you, Galen. And we'd like to, let's see, use the next 10 minutes or so to take some questions from the audience. And thanks again to everyone who sent in questions already. Um, there's still time to submit questions now if you'd like, and we'll try to get to as many as we can before we finish. Um, just want to give you a heads up that if we do not get your question before we finish here during this live webinar, we do have them recorded. And Galen or somebody else from our meter team will be able to get back to you um, via email and answer your question directly. So don't worry, and you can submit any and all questions. Um, all right, so let's see here. Um, Galen, uh, this, this first question was asking about um, measuring nitrogen content in real time. Is it, is it possible to measure nitrogen content in real time, both in soil and in the crops? Well, uh, with electrical conductivity, all that you can measure is the, the uh, total nutrient content. And so uh, nitrogen typically is a pretty large part of the total nutrients that are being taken up. And so uh, in a sense, you can measure that by following the, the electrical conductivity. And that... Uh, often works in soil too. It depends. Some irrigated soils have pretty high salinity, uh, background salinity, and uh, that tends to mask, mask the uh, signal that you can get because all you're measuring is electrical conductivity. Uh, but in soils uh, that have relatively low background salinity, uh, you can do a pretty good job of monitoring the, the uh, nutrients that are there by measuring electrical conductivity. All right. Um, <clears throat> and along those same lines, um, uh, this other individual is asking, what is the general relationship between EC and plant nutrients, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, etc.? Well, the, that relationship is the one I showed in the second slide, I think it was. Um, and again, it differs uh, some depending on the, the uh, makeup of the nutrient solution. But for controlled environment situations, for hydroponic situations, where we mix up the nutrient solution to meet the needs of the plant, uh, typically the plants will take up the nutrients in proportion, uh, in the right proportions. And so the overall concentration that you get from the electrical conductivity will tell you uh, the, the level of nutrients available in the substrate. All right. Um... This next one is, I'd like to know more about the methods used for determination of field moisture capacity and how it relates to plant osmosis. Okay, that, that's uh, something that we didn't cover in this lecture, but we intend to in the next one. And so uh, I'll try to go in into that in more detail, determining the field capacity, or I don't know what you call it in controlled environment situations, but mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk about the water balance and 
and uh, field capacity in the next lecture. Great. Okay. So stay tuned for that one. There's a little plug for the next <laughs> the next webinar. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see. Uh, this next one. Could you please return to the short point made about matrix potential? I think. Would you ever try to account for the sum of matrix plus osmotic potential? or create low-level drought stress by drying back water content more significantly? Now, this gets back to, to the things that we covered in the first lecture. And if you want to go back and review that some, I think uh, we can... I mean, that makes the, the point a lot better than we can here. But, uh, for example, for rock wool, uh, you typically would never dry that down more than to, to about 30%. And by the time you get to 30% water in rock wool, uh, the, the uh, matrix potential on it is, is almost the same as it is when it's, uh, when it's 60 or 70%. The, it hardly changes. And in other substrates, it changes a little more than that. But I would say that the matrix component is never significant when you're when you keep the water contents within the range you typically would for horticultural substrates okay and let's see um there, there's a couple questions uh, i think kind of under a similar vein um this one is asking is it possible to have a real relationship between poor water ec and extract saturation soil ec um, there's also a, another question about using a pour through method and then taking calcul or, or uh, measuring the EC of, of the, uh, you know, the, the, the drainage water. Um, yeah, well, the pour water EC should be the same as the EC of, of, I mean, if you took the substrate and squeezed the water out of it and measured its electrical conductivity, that should be the same as the the poor water EC. Now the the uh, the pour through method, uh, that method is not one that I've used actually, but where you you pour water through and and uh, then measure the electrical conductivity of the water that comes out, and I think that would be more similar to what they call in soils the um, saturation extract electrical conductivity, or I suppose somewhere between pore water and saturation extract. You're adding water to the, to the substrate, so you're diluting the salts to some extent, uh, maybe not as much as you would for a saturation extract. Okay. Um, this next one, I think if I can uh, read this right and get this um, pass on correctly. All right, so in, in one of the graphs you showed that you used um, EC equals 20 decisiemens per meter for soil water. Which crop has been planted in the soil? Is there any restriction for the crop as well as for the instrument? Yeah, the, the crop was cannabis, and uh, there certainly are restrictions that, uh, I mean, just like with matrix stress on crops, there's a limit to, to the osmotic stress that a crop can stand. I'm not sure what it is uh, for cannabis. Well, I don't know what it is for any <laughs> other crop either. I haven't had experience. but uh, And you certainly are, are right to question whether, uh, whether there's instrument limitations there too. As I mentioned, the, that multiplier that we use becomes pretty uncertain when you get down to low water contents and up to high electrical conductivities. So um, there's a lot more uncertainty in that uh, 20 decisiemen number than, than there would be in a 5 decisiemen or something like that, but it, it's still uh, a good indication of how stressed the crop is likely to be. All right. And it looks like I think we've got time for one more question. Um, again, feel free to submit any any more questions that you have. We'll we'll get back to you via email. Um, this last question then is, is along the similar uh, 
similar lines um, about using osmotic stress to mimic um, uh, matrix stress. Um, is there any concern then that as you're introducing um, or, or working with the nutrient level that you might create um, salt toxicity or, or situations where, where you might actually begin to, to damage the plant? Uh, certainly. And, and this is, again, something that the grower would need to work with. And uh, I mean, you have all of the measurements and then you see the response of the plant. Uh, the idea of, of crop steering is not to kill the plant or, or even to maim it, but just to give it a signal that it's time to switch over to a, a different uh, way of, of partitioning its, its uh, assimilate uh, to put it into flowers instead of vegetative growth. And so uh, what you would like to do is to give that signal as... as uh, benignly as you can without damaging the crop. The, the point is not to, to, uh, to damage the crop, but to give a, a uh, steering signal. All right. Thank you again, Galen. Um, that's going to wrap it up for us today. Uh, thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this discussion as much as we did here. Um, and thank, again, thank you again for all the great questions. Uh, we didn't have a chance to get to all of them, but again, like I mentioned before, uh, we will be able to get back to you via email and answer your questions directly if we did not get to them uh, here during the live webinar. Um, also, please consider answering the short survey that will appear after the webinar is finished, just to let us know what types of webinars you'd like to see in the future. Um, and also, uh, as, as we, we plugged earlier, stay tuned for, uh, for a future uh, webinar uh, about water balance and field capacity and all of that. Um, also, for more information on what you've seen today, please visit us at metergroup.com. And finally, look for the recording of today's presentation in your email. And again, stay tuned for future Meter webinars. Thanks again. Stay safe and have a great day.